Hey, future respiratory therapist, got a question here coming to you from Nico. Nico wants to know when you have a patient in pressure control ventilation, how do you identify flow hunger? Now, if you've watched any of my videos, you may have seen a video in the past where I talked about flow hunger being a common issue in volume control. Have never done a video specifically related to pressure control ventilation and how to identify flow hunger there. We'll do that today. Appreciate all you guys for watching. Nico, great question. Hey, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button just so you can get future notifications when I put videos out. If you're sitting there thinking, I got a question, I wonder if I'll answer mine. The answer is yes, I will. So throw it up there, okay? Here we go. We're talking about flow hunger in pressure control ventilation. Now, here's the deal. I'm going to first review flow hunger in volume control ventilation, and then I'm going to go into pressure control ventilation. And what you're going to see here is that it really just breaks down to understanding your modes of mechanical ventilation. So we got VC over here, we got PC over here, and both of these are talking about flow hunger. This is when you have a patient who is breathing in or desiring a higher flow than what the ventilator is delivering. You see, we have this idea that we put patients on the ventilators and what? They automatically breathe like the vent is breathing, but that's not ever the case. Unless they're heavily sedated or paralyzed or brain dead, then they have a drive to breathe that is asking sometimes for something different or more than what the vent is providing. Now, if the vent is providing more than what the patient wants, then you typically find a patient that rides pretty smoothly and in, in, in sync with the vent. But it's when the vent is not meeting that patient's inspiratory demand that we see asynchronies begin to creep in and we start to see a lot of time flow hunger and sometimes volume hunger. Okay, so here we go. We're going to break it down. Now I'm going to show you here. We're going to have a pressure waveform and we're going to do a flow waveform. Okay, now remember, in volume control, our flow is set. So if you have a flow of 60 set, then when the breath is given, that flow is delivered at 60. Nothing can change that. If the patient is breathing in 70 liters per minute, it doesn't matter. The vent says, I'm supposed to give you 60. So the vent doesn't adapt to the patient's inspiratory flow. It gives what is set. That is in volume control. Now when it does this, a breath is delivered. And we typically see something like this. And we come back to baseline or back, to, if we're at PEEP of 5 here, we come back to a PEEP of 5. But this right here, this dip in your pressure waveform is the patient's diaphragm dropping faster and generating an inspiratory flow faster than what the vent is giving. And what it's doing is decreasing and putting this dip in the pressure waveform because the vent flow, the 60 liters per minute, is not sufficient. So you get a drop in intrathoracic pressure because the diaphragm is dropping faster than what the, what the flow of gas is coming in at, which results in a decrease in intrathoracic pressure and a dip in your pressure waveform. Now this can happen throughout any phase of the waveform. You can see one like this. You may see one like this. You may see one that comes up and then dips off like this. So this dip and this dip are also different types of dip. It can happen anytime throughout the pressure waveform. So understand that, okay? Now, when we get into pressure control, things change. You have an, a peep set here, breath goes up, pressure is delivered and held, comes back down to peep, okay? Now remember, this is pressure control, so the pressure is set. It's held. The vent is going to hold that pressure at that level. Now what you're going to see is variations in the volume, I mean in the flow waveform. Because why? Because flow now is variable. And the flow is try the flow is naturally decelerating, so it decelerates, but when the patient sucks in faster than what the vent is giving, the vent says, "Wait a second, I got to increase flow to maintain this pressure." And so you'll see these dips and these variations in the flow waveform. Now, that should make sense, right? You don't see it up here, 
Because the vent responds, oh, you're not going to let the pressure drop. I'm going to increase flow again. And then it drops down and it returns. Okay, now, let's make this make sense. Why in volume control over here do we see flow hunger show up in the pressure waveform? But when we go to pressure control, we see flow hunger show up on the flow waveform. Well, the answer is simple. When we're in volume control, pressure varies. Flow is set. So nothing the patient can do can change this. The only thing that varies in volume control is the pressure. So this is where you see the patient's, what the patient is doing is going to show up here and cause variances in the varying um, pressures. When we go to pressure control, pressure is set, which means it's not going to change. The vent's going to raise the pressure and it's going to do whatever it has to do to sustain that pressure. And it does that through the variable mechanism, which in pressure control is flow. So flow varies. So a patient who is flow hunger that is dropping and asking for more flow faster than what the vent is giving is going to show up in variations on the flow waveform. And that's why it happens. Now, to fix these two things, we have to approach them differently. We have to understand how the vent works. If a patient is flow hungry and you see this drop in the waveform, then you need to increase your peak flow. Okay, increasing the peak flow will take this like this and then come back down. Okay, and hopefully take that dip and remove that. When that dip goes away, you've overcome the patient's inspiratory flow. That's, that's what you need to know. Okay, so increase peak flow in volume control if flow, hungry, flow hunger is present. Now in pressure control, how do we increase flow? Tricky question, right? You got a patient that's flow hungry, in volume control it's easy, increase the flow. But in pressure control, if flow varies, how do we increase the flow to our patients? Well the answer is, you increase the peak inspiratory pressure. When you increase the peak inspiratory pressure, it will require the vent to give a higher flow to achieve that pressure. And that will hopefully smooth out your flow waveform and prevent that flow hunger from happening. Now, people get real nervous when you start doing this. You start to say, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. We don't need to increase the PIP. We don't need to increase this pressure from 25 to, to 30. That's not what's, that's all that's going to do is increase your tidal volume, which is going to increase your minute ventilation, which is going to decrease your, your, your CO2 and increase your pH. We don't want that. Our blood gas looks good. Okay, well, stop treating the blood gas. The blood gas may look good, but your patient is not happy. Your patient doesn't look good. So trust me, trust me. If you increase the PIP in this situation where you have flow hunger happening, your tidal volume will increase minimally. Very, very small. I'm talking if you're getting at 25, you're getting a tidal volume of 400. Raise it up to 30, you get a tidal volume of 415. Why? Because all you're doing now is just meeting the patient's inspiratory demand. You're meeting their inspiratory flow. And so you don't get this rise. It's not like raising PIP from 25 to 30 in a flat, non-moving diaphragm. Patient that's not breathing. Of course, that's going to equate to much larger tidal volumes. But in this case, where you have a patient actively breathing with the vent and breathing to a point where you see variations in your flow pattern, then raising the pressure is only going to do this. Increase the flow and hopefully round that out and make it more comfortable for your patient. Not round it out, smooth it out. Smooth out the rest of that inspiratory period and meet your patients and make them more comfortable. And now you have a good looking blood gas and a good looking patient. Nico, hopes that helps. Hope that helps. Anybody else having questions? Send them to me. I'll answer them. Best wishes, guys.